Good morning. Remember, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on the spiritual journey, you are welcome times in a day. In one of the, bless you. I had an uncle who died from a sneeze like that. <laughs> of course, he was under somebody's bed at the time. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, um, Sherry asked one of, one of our mutual friends who travels all over the world, where was one of the most beautiful places? What was the most beautiful place he'd ever been? And he said the Balkans. So I, I intend to do a blog while we're gone that uh, Wayne will tend to. I, that's my intention. To see how that goes. It's a, it's a beautiful place. The both of them have lots of beautiful cathedrals and monasteries and bombed out buildings. I, I know this was said, but I want to push again the Rob Landis concert and uh, Michael Dowd. If I can get it done this afternoon, I will post and schedule a, a link that will go out about a sermon that Michael Dowd recently delivered called The Confession of <laughs> 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 the Smart Alec. <laughs> Now I'm doing a lot of um, teaching mindfulness, nonviolent communication, the Enneagram, um, creative writing, and art classes. So I would just recognize um, last week, I think it was, I realized that I have now taught from the ages of six months to 92 years and everything in between. Wow. But yeah, and I, um, I, the last time I thought of myself really as a teacher was when someone asked What are you on the Enneagram? I am a counterphobic six. What does that mean? That means that I am motivated by fear and that I tend to run headlong into what I'm afraid of rather than cower from it um, as a response, which explains a lot about how much running I do. And, um, I am not an expert in the Enneagram. I have benefited from it and I have posted on the Ordinary Life website under resources, a book from Sandra Maitre's book, I mean a chapter from her book called The Fall. I think it's one of the best things I have read that helps explain kind of how we get what the Buddhists call the hungry ghost activated in us to go acquiring things and getting rid of things. Uh, but there are people in this room who probably have never heard of the Enneagram until right now. So tell us what it is and why is it better? I am going to preface that with I am not a more loving kindness, compassion, um, justice. No. Um, and so to me, that's the real value of it. And Sister Lois um, at the Cynical Retreat House is a master at um, pairing up. With the Enneagram, I really skate on that a lot because there's a lot to be learned in it. Um, and I'm always trying to bring myself back to practice. I hope I answered your question. Well, one of the ways to get into more about nonviolent communication, which I want you to talk about, is sometimes people will ask me where I get the cartoons that appear on the announcement slides here. And there are uh, three or four primary sources. Wayne Herbert is one. <laughs> the New Yorker is one and a very learned journal called Funny Times is one. And um, I first discovered Funny Times on a trip to Seattle years ago and subscribed to it. And I, it comes out once a month. And about once a year, they have a column in Funny Times by a guy who goes under the name Swami Beyondananda. And he is, I think, he has a website called Wake Up Laughing. 
And he, I think he lives in Austin. And the, the one that came out this past week, he calls for a great uprising. <laughs> he said sometimes people ask if the hand of God is involved in what's going on today. And he said sometimes he thinks just the middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to read you one of the few paragraphs in the whole column that I can read out loud. Uh, and you've got to pay very close attention, and then I'll say why I'm doing this. In the past, we might have called for a revolutionary uprising to overthrow the system. Now we need an evolutionary uprising to overgrow the system. We've been divided into two political tribes, the Red Tribe Republicans and the Blue Tribe Democrats. And the first step is to bring the Red Tribe and the Blue Tribe together in a sacred circle to talk until they are purple in the face. <laughs> because only by standing together as one purple people will the peeps outnumber the perps. <laughs> and now is the time because it is too late to do it soon. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? I mean, the guy is just absolutely brilliant. So I was talking to, um, we, we can talk more about this, but I, I was talking to a guy a few weeks ago about what's going on in our uh, culture. And um, he said to me, well, I don't see any problem with what's going on in the culture. I noticed that my 401k keeps going up and the stock market keeps going up, so anything else that happens doesn't really matter to me. Now, I think that reflects two things. I think it, first of all, reflects the granulated status of our culture, where we have become so individual that we, our, our spiritual practices don't lead us to know that we are one, that we are all on the, the same plane. And I think one of the first things my first spiritual teacher ever said to me was, if you practice the principle of equality, it will take you home. Okay, so that's one thing. And that, that concerned me and my impulse to want to punch him in the face, which I don't do. I don't do that. But I think sometimes, how in God's name can you think that way? And so you're going to teach us today how, how really, we, people are shouting at each other. I can refuse to watch the news because... They don't have discussions on the news anymore. They sh they over talk each other. They get try to get two people with two opposing viewpoints together. They don't listen to each other. They just get, oh, it's, how can we stop that? <laughs> um, I didn't know what I was signing up for. So. <laughs> um, okay. I made some notes too, and I'm trying to find this one. Question. While you look, I made some notes too because I have a tough time remembering who said what. Yeah. I can't remember if uh, whoever said I never met, met a man I didn't like, whether that was Will Rogers or Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh man. Okay, so this, um, this quote Rick, is, is uh, I think, important with what you just said. This comes from Ilya Delio's book, um, The Un Unbearable Wholeness of Being. Um, and the quote is, evolution thrives not on rugged individualism, but on communal interdependence. God is the dynamism of love that gathers being together into greater unity and consciousness. Love is a consciousness of belonging to another, of being part of a whole. To love is to be on the way toward integral wholeness. To live with an openness of mind and heart, to encounter the other not as a stranger, but as another part of oneself. Hmm. And I know when I came out of school and people talked about evolution, it was the 
it was the competitive nature of animals that I remember from evolution. It was the um, uh, survival of the fittest was like the, the only catchphrase that really stayed with me when we talk about evolution. And so to me, that understanding doesn't seem accurate. And that um, the, this is one of the reasons why I love what Michael Dow talks about. If it is actually communal inter interdependence and being part of a whole that's evolving, hopefully together, towards a greater wholeness, then not only do I have to change my mind about what religion is, but I have to change my mind about what evolution is. And when those both outgrow the old ways, then they're absolutely together. And I don't think we're really, we're not there yet to see it that way, but Michael Dow surely helped me kind of transcend some of those old notions that want to keep those two things separate and want to play into our way of dealing with money and goods in a way that wants to keep those things separate. That's my opinion. I think that one of the ways that we, that I put those together, but we progressives have maybe miscommunicated the notion of evolution is that it does mean that things are getting better and better and better. And that's not what it means because evolution also involves chaos. And we are experiencing in Western civilization today the collapse of our institutions. That's happening. And uh, so people respond to that with fear and that fear it, it covers, it expresses itself in a lot of anger about the way that we talk about various things and so I noticed that you have handouts for people about nonviolent communication. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, my intention is not for you to read these documents while we're talking, but to give you no excuse whatsoever for not practicing when you leave. <laughs> so because I've really tried to make it simple and not everybody got some, um, there will be, you might, if you're sitting in the back and you didn't get a copy, you might come look at the empty chairs and pick one up before you leave, because I know there are some in the empty chairs. You don't need to look at them right now, um, because hopefully I can answer your question and those that didn't get one. Okay, enough set up. Um, so, I don't think we learn enough about how to deal with our anger um, in healthy ways. And I, I can just speak for myself. I never learned healthy ways to deal with my anger growing up. What I learned to do was be a good girl and stuff those negative feelings and not use them as a way to deal with what was underneath the iceberg, if you will. Um, and so when, when nonviolent communication came across my path, it helped me understand where those negative feelings were coming from and helped me detach that from this notion that I'm not a good girl if I have them, first of all, which is a huge gift, just to realize there may actually be something positive coming from these feelings that I don't know what to do with, like anger and frustration. Um, so what nonviolent communication does is helps really connect those feelings to the underlying unmet needs that make you have those feelings. And if you feel good, it's because you're having needs met. You have a sense of being fulfilled by whatever choices that you're making, or whatever situations you've put yourself in, have brought you fulfillment in a variety of things. And then so you can connect those good feelings to those needs being met. And in the same, on the, on the flip side, when we talk about conflict, we talk about people being angry or frustrated because those needs aren't being met. Certain needs on those lists aren't being met. So there's a needs wheel on one of those documents that you have that gives a pretty good list of these needs that we have. And this is the, this is the big wow to me in common that all humans have all over the globe, no matter where you were born, no matter what um, privilege you were born into, what, whatever kind of um, structures or systems you were born into. Um, Marshall Rosenberg has done work all over the globe to discover that we all have these things in common. And it is quite a privilege to consider several of these on the list for us because there's a, a lot of people, maybe the majority of the people um, on the planet um, 
they're, it's just out of reach to have things like security and safety and physical well-being, like from clean drinking water and that sort of thing. But if, if everyone were to have access to all these, every person on the planet would want to have all of these needs met. Now, the way this comes into practice, a lot of theory, the way this comes into practice in the most basic ways for me is to understand when I'm triggered. Let's say I'm in a conflict and I'm angry. If I can connect to that need that's underneath and I can assume that there's a need underneath whatever's um, going on for the person I'm with, we may be arguing at this level, but there's common ground underneath, and that's those needs. Um, again, because I'm a six, I have a, on the Enneagram, I have a five wing, which makes me want to learn these things and these theories, and I also have a seven wing that makes me want to be really creative with that, right? So, and I want to apply them to my life. What I learned, the first few years, I stayed over here on the five part, and I just tried to teach everybody how to do it, but I wasn't really doing it myself. So now what I've tried to do is um, make these practices that are simple, more simple, because I honestly think when you do the self, this is what we call self-empathy and nonviolent communication. When you just sit with that wheel of needs and identify what is it I want more of right now that I don't think I can get, and I imagine getting that, let's say it's peace and harmony, super simple example, if my two-year-old's having a temper tantrum, if I am getting upset and I can say, wow, I want ease, I want predictability, I want self-care, i.e. I need sleep, right? Then I get really personal with what's going on with my reaction to her. She's not a bad girl. She's learning how to be in the world. It's not about me being a good parent or being a bad parent. And the thoughts I'm having in that moment makes me feel like that, right? <laughs> but if I can look at this list, then I know I'm triggered because I'm tired, because I want predictability, because I want ease, and I want her to have the tools to get those in the world too. My energy changes, and this is what I've come to like in the last year, two years, that made me so passionate about putting all those handouts in your seats. Because I thought, well, want everybody to know how liberating it is to be able to sit with my daughter who's having a temper tantrum instead of feeling like she's a terrible little girl and that I'm a terrible mother, I can say she doesn't know how to express what she needs, where we need to connect more. But number one, I love her and I'm here to keep her safe. And I want her to know that I want to give her the tools to be an advocate for her needs in a way that the world's going to respond positively to. And that's so much more um, empowering than to have the other thoughts I was having. And that's why I'm so passionate about nonviolent communication because whether you're talking about a tantruming two-year-old or a tantruming 70 year old with different views of yours on politics and religion, it gets down to the same thing. It gets down to honoring that other person, just having the same needs, and that they have attachments to strategies, mm -hmm. i.e. thoughts on gun, gun rights and gun control, just like I do. And guess what? Underneath it all, we all want our families to feel safer. And if I can connect with that in that moment, then not only is my head in a place where there may be a potential for connection, even more so, and this is where it becomes spiritual to me, my heart is in a place where I can have empathy for the other person and not see them as the enemy to me. That's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> well, I think that what you're talking about is a commitment to be uh, effective in your communication because what you're talking about is not efficient. It's, it's not. And, and the first few years of doing this, that drove me nuts. I'm like, I am never going to be able to use this language. <laughs> because no one, not only are we highly opinionated and attached to our strategies, we're also efficiency experts. And, and no one wants to spend their time having these long conversations with me. 
So that's when I really felt liberated by fixing this first. I'll, for instance, my daughter, when she was having the tantrums, and this is why this, this moves into grace for me, because our daughter was struggling um, with language. She had hearing problems that we didn't know about, and we were in the midst of getting her different forms of therapy. She didn't have the language. It's not like I could have a four-step process of conflict resolution with my two-year-old daughter. What happened was I did the empathy. My energy changed and she went limp in my arms and stopped crying. Um, and to me, I know that doors open in communication with other people when we can shift our energy. It does not matter how well-trained we are in these communication techniques, if we're not doing it for the right reasons, if our energy is still ugly, we, we know, we have instincts, we know someone's trying to manipulate us if we're using the right language for the wrong purpose. So this work is so much more important to me. Am I speaking to myself in a way that connects my head and my heart? And the language can come. Or I can have less attachment to the way the person I'm with responds to me. That's huge. If I can say, my goal, I, I'm not going to be so determined to change this person's mind before they walk out the door. That puts a lot of... Nobody wants to be changed. No, nobody wants... I mean, you, if, you want, if you want to frustrate, frustrate yourself to all get out, then, you know, <laughs> try to do that. But change your mind, change your heart, and then see what can happen. All of this with healthy balance, by the way. I'm not talking about becoming a pushover. I'm not talking about changing the way I am. I'm talking about doing this with healthy boundaries. And that's why like Brene Brown's work, you know, courage and vulnerability and open-heartedness, um, it changes things. Um, I could go on for hours about this, but I have questions for you. Well, and, and, you know, I, I have said it here so many times that it couldn't be counted, but I think that the, the both the essence and the content of spiritual practice is what you're talking about. And that is being able to pay attention to what is going on without being reactive, without being judgmental, just to notice. And I know many of you, some of you have read a book by a guy named Michael Singer called The Untethered Soul. And um, if you want a less, if you want a handbook about how to take up this observer status um, and, and begin to notice more about yourself. Learn something about what Freud called the observing ego. Um, in Buddhism, there's an acronym that is used called RAIN. I was talking to Matt Russell about this one day, and he said, oh yeah, we use this in the recovery work all the time. The, have you heard of it? Yeah, heard of it? I had never heard about it until um, I, I was reading this book in, in Buddhism, and um, RAIN stands for recognize the feeling or thought, accept it, don't be judgmental about it, identify where it shows up in your body, and then develop a non-attached relationship to it. You're observing. Recognize, accept, investigate, non-attached. RAIN. And uh, so we have something that um, ticks us off, driving on the freeway, or somebody's religious or political views, and notice your reaction. Just to, by the way, that's the meaning of nirvana. Did you know that? Nirvana means I'm done. <laughs> So, okay, I'm just going to bring this up. This paper, my intention is that this, this piece of your handouts, and I'll put these in the, um, the summary that goes out on Tuesday, um, but this piece really is to me meant to be a worksheet for you if you choose to um, use it to break those things down. You have a stimulus, something triggers you, what is it? 
And this is the beauty of nonviolent communications practice of report that like a camera. Cameras don't judge, cameras don't bring in the past, cameras don't say they always respond that way. Cameras say this is what happened. This is the action that triggered me, right? So you write that down without all the judging language and the assumptions. And then this part in the middle, and, and from Viktor Frankl's quote, the, um, uh, between stimulus and response, there's a space, and in that space, um, you have a choice, and within that choice lies your growth and your freedom. This space right here is where, to me, the spiritual practice hits the road, where the rubber hits the road, right? The more you understand about what body sensations are your red flags that you're triggered, because it's hard to find that pause, <laughs> but your body will help you find that pause. What are the feelings you're having in that moment? What thoughts are you having in that moment? Once you understand yourself, i.e. do a lot of spiritual practice, then it becomes easier to identify these in the moment. And then you can cash in on that gift of choice about how you're gonna respond. If you don't do this, this is why I have this graphic, if you don't do this, your ego will fast forward you into that automatic reaction that is what I call the false self-fulfilling prophecy. You are playing into what you think the danger is and you're adding to it. But if you respond out of love and compassion and understanding, then you have the possibility to respond in loving kindness and compassion, not only for yourself, but for other people. Um, so this is your worksheet to start noticing that. You can, you can dovetail this with the awareness exam that the Jesuits use, where you're scanning through your day, and you might be surprised that even the smallest things can trigger us, and that can help you practice. You know, don't take on the huge things. Don't try to change the mind of your relative that you argue with about politics and religion all the time. Start small and look back at your day and see where you responded with something that was a little more harsh or sharp. You wish you would have responded differently. Use this and see what comes out of it. Do you have that exam in practice on the handout? It's also in their chairs. Okay. And I've dovetailed it with nonviolent communication so that um, that needs wheel that's on another page that gives you all the language about values and needs, that can be used with the awareness exam. I guess if somebody were, were want, going to do something like this, it might be helpful for them to keep a journal. Uh, <laughs> I should have mentioned that in here before. <laughs> Paste these into your journal. So, um, Jim Finley tells a story about uh, this boxing match, where you know what boxing is, right? There's two idiots get in this ring and try to knock each other's brains out. And one of the boxers between rings noticed the other boxer making the sign of the cross. And he asked his manager, what's he doing? He said, well, he's praying. And the guy says, will, will it do any good? And his manager said, they will if he can fight. <laughs> <laughs> What we're talking about is that believing something, following a particular ritual about something, having a dogma that you hang on to, won't do you any good if you can't fight. You have to have a skill to be able to be non-reactive, and that's something that develops as you practice. And um, I think it takes, um, well, of course, you have to have a practice, and it helps me to have a journal, to have a place where I can write down, down ideas and, and keep a log about uh, what's, what's going on and have a way to review my life and what I'm learning, what's valuable to me, uh, and that's part of what goes into daily practice. I have heard you talk about um, shadow archetypes, mm -hmm. so I think this work that we're talking about right now has to do with like dealing with your shadow. Mm -hmm. Can you say more? Well, I believe that we are taken to the work that we need to do. And um, the guy who trained me in union analysis, one of the first things he said to me was, you're not in this room by accident. 
And if you are not open to doing the kind of things that you hear Brooke and me talk about, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be open to this. So there is a sense in which, I don't mean that the hand of God is, the hand of God is everywhere, but I don't mean that we're puppets that have been manipulated here. I mean that we try to work to see things at a, a higher level and to take things that are at the unconscious level that can drag us down. Everybody in this room knows what it's like to get captured. You can get captured when you hear somebody say something or you hear a political ad on TV or something and you can just get, get captured. And that capturing can drag you down into a territory where uh, anger, fear, sadness can find expression and you're, you, you're out of control. I mean, people will say later, I don't know what got into me. Something had a hold of me. That's just true. I think the inverse of this is when we come up occasionally and we look around and we see, oh my God, it's like Thomas Burton did on the streets in Louisville. He came up for air and saw all these people and he realized, oh my God, I love these people. These, I love what's going on. I see God here that's being above water. So um, I, I keep saying that we have operating in our culture four powerful unconscious archetypes. And they're, they're ruining us. They're killing us. The, the, the first is the archetype of the patriarchy. This country is run by old white guys. And we are denying ourselves the feminine, the feminine energy uh, that lies within us all to find expression. The other archetype is there's something wrong with you. You need to go get an Alexis or a Tesla or Lamborghini <laughs> or a beer or whatever. There's something wrong. I, 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 more and more people uh, I see all the time, their religion has damaged them by saying, you're a sinner, you're lost. Um, you're part of God, just like Jesus is part of God. And um, I'm trying to be careful about my language here because I know Tommy said it in the sermon. I said it in the pastoral prayer today. There is something that's delicious and to be cherished about honoring that we are a child of God, just like Jesus was a child of God, right? But you have to think of child not as infantile, as not as keeping you down, not as keeping you in control, as uh, being controlled, as somebody who's not on the level with everybody else. That kind of child is not helpful. But that's an archetype that operates in our culture. You're not mature enough, grown up enough to take control, we'll do it for you. And, and the fourth archetype that is killing us is the belief in violence. That we can just blow people up or say hateful things, and that's okay. Uh, words hurt people. What you label somebody hurts them. And sometimes words can hurt worse than a punch, you know? So we need to be careful with violent language, all of those things. Does that answer your question? Okay. No battery? No uh, battery. We have somebody who's going to correct that, and I can give you mine here. Um, so I, I brought some notes because I forget uh, who said what to, but I love, I love this from Elie Dalio. We are not rescued from the world. from the world by divine grace. Rather, 
We are saved or made whole in and through the world by cooperating with divine love. Should I say that again? <laughs> we are not rescued from the world. I, I'm such a visual person, by God. <laughs> We're not rescued from the world by divine grace. Whether, rather, we are saved or made whole in and through the world by cooperating with divine love. So we don't get to sit around and wait for heaven to come. We have to participate with love and create it here as part of this whole being that we participate in. You don't have to die to go to heaven. You can participate in it. Well, you're already there. <laughs> and, and the deal is to, to recognize it. When, when we die, we don't go anywhere. <laughs> it's not like you die and your soul orbits the earth for a couple of times and then goes out to heaven somewhere. It takes a right if you're conservative or left. If you're left. <laughs> you don't go anywhere. That's one of the, the primary teachings of, of Jesus. And I'm not being uh, exclusive here, but, you know, Jesus kept saying to people, I and the Father are one, and so are you. Now, if you get the implication of that, and don't let it go to your head, right? It's not an ego trip. It's a soul trip. It's doing soul work that is able to say, I am not you. But I'm not other than you either. Now, if I can, if I can absorb that, if I can embrace that, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm going to because it's in my best interest to love you and to make sure that you are safe. I'm not the earth, but I'm not other than the earth either. And if we could absorb that, we take care of the planet better. Than we do. I am not God, but I'm not other than God either. We're in the sacred heart of God. I think one of the things that I love both about Buddhism and about Islam is that neither one of these, that Buddhism isn't a religion really, but they're not doctrinal. They're not, oh, if you believe this, then you're going to be okay. Um, beliefs are like Buddha said, beliefs are like a boat. You, you get in the boat to take you across a treacherous piece of water. And when you get to the other side, you get out of the boat. You don't pick it up and carry it. It's done its work for you so that you have been into some other place. And as I keep saying, we have to do this again and again and again and again. We get to do this again. So a lot of people are attached to their beliefs and their doctrines. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are not doing a lot of the practice, possibly. So are you hopeful about the future? And what brings you hope? Um, I have a friend who told me that when he was asked by his dentist if he flossed, he said, yes, I floss religiously every Easter and Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> and so my dentist says, you don't have to floss all your teeth. You just floss the one with your teeth. <laughs> so that's the way I think it is with a spiritual practice. And, and um, I, I don't like to use the word hope or optimism because I think they get tied to specific outcomes. And um, I have said in here, quoting Jim Finley a number of times, that God protects us from nothing, but sustains us in everything. And if in the Christian religion the cross has any meaning whatsoever, that's it. That 
in, in the telling of the story of the crucifixion, um, God did not abandon Jesus. That's a parable, but God did not abandon Jesus. God sustains us no matter what. So, we, when I came up with this theme about living in a gap between the no longer and the not yet, I mean that. We are in a space of not knowing. We are in a space of chaos and anticipated chaos. I mean, I don't mean to be uh, chicken little, but institutions are collapsing. I don't pick on the Roman Catholics, but if the Roman Catholics don't make a major course correction after the pedophile thing, they're done. I've got some ideas for what they should do. <laughs> If the, if the Methodist Church comes out in February with a statement that sounds exclusionary, we're done for. I mean, I'm not being hysteronic to say that. Now, so we live out of two stories. We, we, we're, the story of where we have been, uh, progress and naive, lack of complexity and all that, that's over, that's done with. We're done. Now, we really are navigating this territory where we, we have what we don't know in front of us. And we have a choice to live out of a story of wholeness, to have faith in wholeness, or to live out of a story of separation. That's our choice. You can't prove any of that. That's why we call it faith. But I have the faith that if I live out of the story of separation, I'm going to be afraid, I'm going to be angry, I'm going to be sad, I'm going to be upset, I'm going to be tight-fisted. I started to say conservative, but that would be a good thing. But if I live out of a story of wholeness, I'm going to be hopeful and joyful and anticipatory and inclusive and um, happy what you want to do, which story you want to live out of, you have a choice. And um, when in the in the Jesus narrative, when some men, and I'm sure women too, but they got excised out of the story, come to Jesus and say, um, "We want to know where you live." He doesn't tell them where you live. He just said. Why don't you come see? Why don't you come see? And that invitation to be, just come on. Uh, I think one of the reasons that I call this gathering ordinary life is that um, religion has been guilty of making people feel special and worthy. And you're not. <laughs> Nobody's special. Nobody's worthy in the sense that or everybody's special, everybody's worthy, however you want to look at it, but the teachings of Jesus were available to everybody. That's why there is this emphasis on the poor and those who had been excluded, the so-called downtrodden, those who did not have anything. The same thing is true in, in Buddhism. The teachings of Buddhism are available for everybody. And if you practice them, if you embrace them, it doesn't make you special. It makes you happy. It makes you joyful. It makes you loving. Maybe it makes you have humility. Maybe it makes you be non-reactive. Because both Jesus and Buddha said, don't judge. You know, and, and that do mean to be not discriminating. You don't drink dirty water. But it just meant to be, to, to have that kind of inclusivity, to be open to everybody. Um, I jot down thoughts that I have after I hear you say things like that. And one that came to me, um, I think sometime last week was, in the movie The Incredibles, there's, um, there's a, a line that says, um, uh, "Nobody's when everybody's special, nobody is, right? And so um, my kind of, I think, Bill Curley-inspired counterpoint to that that I had in the middle of the night that woke up and jotted down was, um, 
when everybody's special, nobody is, or maybe until everyone's seen as until everyone is seen as special, then everyone ultimately is. Like we have to see everyone as special, and then we ultimately participate in that notion we're chasing. So this peace, love, joy that I keep harping on is a way to be. And uh, occasionally somebody will challenge me about something about, if I make it sound like Christianity is, is an exclusive religion or not exclusive religion, well, what about Jesus saying that he was the way? And um, the way exists not because Jesus lived it. Jesus lived the way because it's the way to be. Is it different? Say it again. It didn't become the way because Jesus lived it. Jesus lived it because it was the way. And he says, given the dynamics of the Christian story, follow me. And if we make that to be exclusive, then we go and kill the infidels. And that doesn't seem to get us any worse, except more revenge. I want to get to one more thing before we go, and I'll be brief, just because this is the one thing I wanted to get to the last time we had a dialogue. Um, you were bringing up the um, St. Francis prayer um, the last time we talked in May, and so I have this worksheet that's in your packet, and it is a very specific way to get to living out that prayer of St. Francis in your life. So um, I wanted to make sure that you notice that and basically, you break it down line by line and say, um, um, let's see here. Here it is. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. It's separated so that you can write on that line. Where are you recognizing hatred? This could be in your own thoughts to yourself. This could be your thoughts about what's going on in the world, and how do you bring love to that? So this is my challenge, is to break that down and very specifically see how you can apply this to your daily life in a very specific way that you encounter hatred, injury, doubt, despair, darkness, and sadness, and how you very specifically can bring love, can bring pardon, can bring faith, hope, light, and joy. So. I wanted to cover this last time, and I didn't do it then, so. Great prayer. So I want to close by uh, reading to you a poem by Rumi. <coughs> Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world's too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. So no matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this. You carry precious cargo. I, am, I love you. I'm so grateful for you and for uh, all of you who cover this during the next uh, four weeks. And I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> I'm going to come and be here on the on, on two of those Sundays because I'm coming for the Rob Landis Sunday. You carry precious cargo, so you better watch your Thank step. You. <laughs> Thank you.